All right. Well, good morning, everybody, and really appreciate you tuning in. This is, I believe, our 11th Training Tuesday, Miranda. Yep. Yeah, so we're uh, covering a lot of different issues with the with this series. Today, we're focused on reducing harvest dust, and we've got a great lineup of people ready to, to tell us all about it. We've up first, we've got, well, I'm going to start out just by going over the basics and talking about uh, some of the regulations that are controlling, but really uh, more about our research program. Then Jason Baer, who's a sales representative from Exact, is going to get into the nitty gritty of what our dust toolkit and best management practices are. Then uh, Lucas Avila is gonna talk, uh, he's an area manager with Farmland Management Services. He's gonna get into how to use a conditioner or the benefits of using a conditioner. Then hopefully we've got Tony Verissimo on the line. He's a grower and he's going to with five rings harvesting and he's going to give us his perspective and, and what he does to help reduce dust. Then we've got Ted Strauss, who uh, has, has often presented to our committees and he works with NRCS. He's an air quality resource conservationist and really uh, has been a champion of the low dust incentive program that uh, NRCS has, as well as other air quality programs. And then lastly, we're going to have Ashley Korea, who's our field and outreach specialist uh, with the Almond Board, and she's going to go over how do we measure success uh, from the growers that are participating in our California Almond Sustainability Program. So let's see if uh, I ask you to advance to the next slide, Miranda. Thanks. So some of the reasons that the Almond Board has really made dust a focus, and it is one of our uh, 2025 goals, is that we, we as an industry are larger than ever, and we know that dust is one of the most visible parts of, of growing almonds at harvest. As we do deficit irrigation as uh, hull split comes on creates very dry conditions and we can get uh, heavy winds and typically you want to you man manage your orchard floor so that it's really doesn't have any weeds so that can create very dry conditions especially as you drop the kernels and nuts on the ground and then go through and uh, sweep them and, and get them in a windrow and then especially pick them up. So we want to be considerate of those that we live, work, play and and drive near. So uh, we want to take every do everything we can to reduce dust, which can be both a health concern, but also a safety concern. Next slide. So what is dust? Uh, what we see in the air is not actually the regulated particles. Uh, California has a, California in the nation has a regulatory program for different sized particulate matter. PM10 is the first one that we uh, had to get into attainment with. It's slightly larger. The, the most recent one is PM2.5. You can see here, that these are not visible to the eye, but they can get into the body and into the lungs and then cause health issues. The visible uh, dust that we see in the air that is largely a concern at harvest is larger than the particulate matter that's regulated. So typically it's, um, although there is some fraction of what we see in the air that is PM10 or PM2.5, it's generally not considered a regulatory concern, meaning it's it's not something that is uh, largely covered by the national ambient air quality standards. But it is something that we need to take care of uh, out of being a good community member. And there are also uh, economic and pest control advantages of of keeping dust down at harvest as well. So why does the San Joaquin Valley have some of the worst air quality in the nation? It's it's not uh, at all 
because of harvest dust. It's actually largely because of the geography of where we are, that we're surrounded by mountains. And then we also have I-5 and 99 coming down as well, which leads to quite a bit of uh, PM 2.5 in the air. So that's been the largest contributor to our poor air quality. Uh, that said, when uh, when we did have to meet, and this graph on the right hand side shows the some of the progress that we've made, when we did have to reduce PM10 emissions, the the almond community participated both by swapping out engines and moving to towards tier four engines, and then also doing uh, significant amounts of research to figure out what exactly could we do during the harvest process to reduce dust. And you can see again from that graph that we have been improving air quality in, in the Central Valley. Go ahead, go ahead. So uh, what have the standards been and uh, what, what have we done to contribute to attaining them? Well, the PM 2.5 attainment strategy, which was the most recent one adopted, uh, they during that uh, analysis period, they actually modeled a 50% reduction in harvest dust. And what they saw is that for the air quality monitors that largely are in the big cities in the Central Valley, that it really wasn't going to move the needle that much in the way of getting to attainment. So uh, that said, they did have what they called neighborhood strategies, and by reducing harvest dust, they were a, they uh, did want to leave no stone unturned. So the San Joaquin Valley Air District worked on developing a new incentive program that helps growers and custom harvesters purchase equipment that is low dust. And we'll talk about that more uh, as this as we go on this morning. Earlier, we had the PM10 plan that I mentioned. And for this one, because there is a larger amount of PM10 in harvest dust than 2.5, it was seen as an advantage to uh, really promote, develop and promote these best practices that we're going to talk about today. So as part of, uh, we did uh, meet that target and uh, we do, we are in attainment for the PM10 regulations. One of the things that uh, growers have to do to uh, show that we're, we're still in attainment is fill out these uh, conservation management practices form each year just to show how you uh, might be contributing to keeping dust down. This can also include uh, oiling or keeping water on roads during harvest. And uh, we may actually be revisiting this to to make sure that it also includes some of the best practices that we're going to talk about today. So uh, we spent uh, quite a bit of time developing the practices and uh, when the board asked us, you know, where where do we want to put out the challenges to the industry in terms of improving? Harvest dust and reducing it by 50% was one of those goals that was uh, selected. And uh, next slide. We, we've done quite a bit of research uh, already, beginning with working with Texas A&M and UC Davis. We initially started out just by seeing where in the process are we seeing dust. And the majority of the dust happens at pickup, but uh, where does that dust come from? It comes from sweeping. And that's why several of our, our research uh, looked at how can we reduce the number of passes and the pickup speed to keep the amount of dust in that windrow down. We initially developed a white paper that uh, with the San Joaquin Valley Air District that established that our emission factor was around 31% less than what it had been uh, assumed to be previously. Other research we did looked at lowering fan speeds, setting the sweeper height appropriately, again, to keep uh, dirt out of the windrow. We 
also contributed to multiple studies to develop uh, and qualify new low dust equipment. Uh, this is primarily at pickup. And with uh, with those advances in our in our CAS program and with with the uh, research that we did, we were able to see on average around a 50 percent reduction in dust at harvest. And and with those studies, NRCS began offering a low dust harvester incentive program through EQIP. And then when the district as part of that uh, PM 2.5 plan also uh, saw an opportunity to to help growers adopt these low dust harvester uh, pieces of equipment. We did another round of research with them with a with uh, additional equipment and we're able to get uh, get those uh, manufacturers approved for that program as well. Now, uh, even if the entire industry adopted our best practices and moved to low dust harvesters, we might still not reach our 50% goal. So there are some other advances that uh, we're looking towards and developing that will help us achieve that. One is off ground harvesting, which isn't the focus of today's seminar, but uh, it is something that's a focus of our harvest work group and is something that uh, we were working really hard to to develop. And then also self compatible varieties because they reduce the number of passes for uh, for each step by half. We also see count that as part of our CAS program as a 50% dust reduction. So again, when we when we look at this and we do the calculation in CAS, we see uh, using low dust harvesters, some uh, type of off ground harvesting, self compatible varieties and reducing the number of sweeping passes is really uh, so the metrics that we're using. But all of the practices here help reduce dust, help uh, keep dirt out of the windrow, and then make sure that when it comes time to do pickup, where 75% uh, of the dust comes from, uh, it can be as clean as possible. So, when uh, so we're talking about it today on Training Tuesday, but if uh, after this you want to find out more on our website, we uh, after we did all this extensive research, we developed the Harvest Dust BMPs. We have a physical toolkit that if you want to copy, we can we can mail it to you. And we do outreach through the toolkit. We've also got videos online. In the past, we've done field demonstrations of low dust equipment. And then also on our website, and I'll show you the links in a second, uh, you, you can get access to all these materials. So a uh, simple way to find our uh, materials is just to go to almonds.com slash harvest dust, and you'll see each of these videos that we've developed for each stage from uh, pre-harvest uh, maintaining a clean orchard floor to sweeping and doing the pickup. And then there are actually uh, two sites here. They are spelled out and we get into some of the why as well uh, on these sites. And like I said, we've done demo events. We've flown drones uh, as as these different uh, manufacturers tested their uh, pickup machines, and it is visible. Uh, we, we also, as, as another uh, research project, we got trained people out into the field that can actually measure opacity in the dust plume, and they were actually able, with their, with their just the naked eye, to see that uh, dust is reduced by these machines. And we've also proven that through much more advanced techniques uh, with air filters, both for the incoming air and the outgoing air, just to show that the use of these low dust harvesters reduces it by on average 50%. And this is a little bit about the, the research where we uh, worked with Exact, Flory, Jackrabbit, and Weiss McNair and compared that with a more conventional piece of equipment. 
And as I said, uh, the NRCS, Ted Strauss is going to be talking later, but uh, we've also got the incentive program through the San Joaquin Valley Air Pollution Control District. And if you're interested in that, just go to their website or contact Aaron Tarango. And I believe we've also got a representative of theirs on the line today if you have any questions about their program. And now, uh, this is where we'll come back to later with Ashley, but uh, up next, we've got Jason Bear from Exact, who's going to tell us, uh, really get into some of the details about how to do harvest and how to do it right and, and keep your dust down. All right. Thank you, Jesse. <clears throat> uh, go ahead and share my screen here. So yeah, um, as Jesse said, my name is Jason Bear. I'm with Exact Corporation. Um, certainly appreciate all of you uh, joining us, uh, taking time out of your a busy Tuesday that feels like a Monday, as I already thought it was. Um, so appreciate you all all joining us. Just go over some some harvest tips and just some some common knowledge. A lot of this is going to be old hat to you probably. Uh, hopefully some of it uh, may trigger something different for this coming harvest. But most importantly, I think it's just important to always keep in mind and remind ourselves um, we grow over 80% of the world's almonds right here in our, our little central valley. So it's important to do our part and to be good stewards uh, and to be good neighbors uh, for our industry. So it's, a, it's always a good reminder. So appreciate the goals the Almond Board has set forth um, to, to keep, us, uh, keep us honest. So just a quick agenda overview, just pre-harvest. Um, talk about during harvest and then we'll talk about the low dust harvester technology that's that's on the table at this point <clears throat> um, there's as Jesse said some really good advancements that have happened over the last 10 years uh, we've really taken some big strides in the right direction here uh, towards reducing harvest dust and that all starts with before harvest um, you know with a clean orchard floor, floating it out, burning down the weeds, mowing down, getting that floor as clean as we can um, prior to harvest to you know, reduce the, the amount of foreign matter if possible into the windrows. Um, and then it comes down to just planning, uh, planning the routes of, of your sweeper, of your harvester, um, as much as possible, uh, avoid blowing in towards buildings, avoid blowing towards uh, the roadways, um, housing, schools, what, what have you. Um, we're, we're surrounded by, by a lot of watching eyes, so the, the best we can do to blow into our natural filters in the trees um, is, is good. And then another, another trick um, is, if you can, uh, blow one way through the orchard uh, with, with the sweeper just to help you know, reduce blowing passes um, and, you know, stirring up less dirt that way um, is very helpful. Uh, but again, it's all pretty well common knowledge here as far as just sanitation and, and keeping the floor clean prior to harvest um, to help minimize dirt and, again, foreign material into the windrow of, of almonds. On the sweeper, um, you know, this is this has been a challenging one to, you know, help cut down on the dust, but there have been, you know, great strides uh, in this arena uh, towards towards that. Um, you know, the 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 one that doesn't need to be talked about, but I'm going to talk about is is just head depth. Um, it's easy to, you know, to run field to field and just it swept well last time, so let's just keep going. Don't no waste time. <laughs> but the importance of adjusting that sweeper head field to field is is pretty critical to, um, you know, minimizing the dirt into the windrow, but also just you know doing a better sweeping job. Um, 
So the other the other thing we have done here is uh, we we actually use dual gauge wheels on our sweeper head, which has really improved um, flotation. Really has done a better job of sweeping because this sweeper head does our sweeper head does not dig into the ground if you have a little rougher terrain or hilly ground. Um, it, it rides with the ground. Um, instead of just pushing through uh, little, you know, little hills or berms, what have you. Um, so that's that's been a big benefit and a big plus on on helping uh, help helping with that, improving the flotation. Um, another one, you know, in the past it's been talked about just using wire tying or doubling wire tying. Um, the reality is, I would say. Not many people, if any people, are doing that, if any growers are doing that. So the a proven fact of how to help and a, a good way to um, still do a great job sweeping and actually improve your sweeping is using these rubber fingers that are in this picture here, um, some affectionately referred to as chicken pluckers. Um, fun fact, if you want to just get a good laugh or see what these really have been used for, they are for defeathering chickens, um, Google chicken pluckers. So yeah, interesting little fact. But anyway, they, they help out a lot on the on the sweeping side. Um, again, you can see when they flex down, they still have you know gaps in between, so to help reduce the dirt. But then they also stick down below that wire tine to where you don't have to set the wire tine quite as as low as in the past if you're using just a solid rubber backing behind there. Um, and there's there's varying lengths of those those rubber fingers as well. Um, honestly, the longer they are, the better. Um, you know, keep the wire tying off the ground a little bit more. But again, if you have gopher holes in your field, divots, what have you, um, those rubber fingers kind of pop down in there to help clean up the the floor a lot better. Uh, a little more forgiveness that way. And then as well, reducing passes. Uh, reducing those sweeper passes is critical um, to, to reducing sweeper dust. Um, so using a, utilizing a closing arm or a reduced pass sweeper as much as possible is going to help out significantly. Um, the innovation of the brush on the sweeper has been a huge stride in that direction as well. Uh, as that brush, you can run right up against your drip hose. You, the trunks of the tree um, doesn't damage the tree, but it actually helps, you know, it moves, you know, quite a bit of almonds over to the head instead of relying on the blower uh, to blow through to the next row. Um, so that that brush is highly critical in, in helping reduce dust and again improving the overall sweeping sweeping job there. Um, so moving on, um, I know that. Lucas is going to be covering this a little more in depth. I just wanted to kind of skim over conditioning real quick. Um, and, and the benefits, I mean, this this is it really gained traction over the last, again, five to 10 years. Um, <clears throat> but this is something we've been doing for, for many years, to be honest with you. Um, and seeing the benefit there um, of just speeding up harvest, if nothing else, has been huge. Um, you can gain three to four days per variety, depending on weather conditions. But as you see, I mean, helping minimize, minimize and equalize the drying process has been really important. Um, and just get, getting a more even moisture content. Um, you know, it, it also, to be real honest, uh, a conditioned windrow will make any, most harvesters look like low dust harvesters. And then, you know, we, we actually now offer a, a true low dust conditioner um, that, that helps take the dust out of the, the conditioning side as well. Um, but, you know, outside of just cleaning windrows, speeding up harvest, it actually saves a lot on trucking. Um, we have growers that are, that are saving up to six truckloads per day that aren't being shipped into their plant um, just based on, on cleaner windrows. Uh, they're not they're not taking that foreign material. They're not taking all that extra garbage into the into the plant. Um, 
which that has its obvious uh, benefits as well. Runs cleaner, runs faster. Your guys in the plant uh, are much happier. Um, so, but again, just wanted to skim over that real quick, but, but Lucas will uh, take a little deeper dive into uh, the benefits of conditioning. Harvesters, um, these are, <laughs> these are kind of the, uh, the guys that, that get the, all the eyes, all the eyeballs on them for this, for the dust challenges that we face. Um, but there's, but there's been some massive strides here, um, in a lot of different areas. Um, it's been good. All the manufacturers have kind of stepped up in this, this arena that has, they've re everybody's really made some big improvements here. Um, but again, as with the sweeper, uh, goes without saying is adjusting your pickup head. Uh, the rule of thumb is, you know, before harvest in the shop or on a flat surface is to get those wire teeth about a quarter inch off the ground as a starting point. Inevitably, you will change that six trees into the into the first field. Um, but that that's always for me personally has been my rule of thumb is pull the harvester in. You know, if you if you're set too deep, you're going to know immediately. But run in a few trees, make sure you you are where you think you are, and then adjust it from there. Um, for optimum performance, picking up less dirt, digging um, to to create you know just a cleaner load. Um, <clears throat> another trick of the trade again most of you probably know this is as much as possible they'll blow into the the shook row um uh, of trees uh just to help you know you're, you're not blowing dust back onto almonds that are yet to be shook um you know it helps you know helps a lot with that uh on the staking side and just sanitation as well um monitoring ground speeds fan speeds per field conditions. Um, to, to be brutally honest, this is a good talking point, um, but the, the reality of how many guys are, are actually going slow to reduce dust is, I would wager not, not many guys are doing that. Um, but the reality is also that helps. Um, so if it's possible to do that, do it. But I also understand the reality is we have a lot of acres to to get across to um, to yeah to meet these you know get meet the goals and get you know get the get the nuts into into the plants before it's too late um, so it's all about speed and efficiency um, but thankfully we you know there's technology out there that you don't have to slow down you don't have to adjust your fan too much to to reduce the dust. Um, so that's something to keep in mind there, but but again, you know, allowing the uh, the chains of the of the harvester to work to do their job prior to it hitting that that cleaning fan is important. Um, and using twin rods, <clears throat> the twin rod system throughout the harvesters really is a big benefit uh, for for multiple reasons. Uh, the first is cleaning uh, separation. Um, starting at the pickup head all the way back through the elevator chain, if you have twin rods throughout the whole machine, definitely helps a lot. I mean, you, you immediately start sifting that dirt out, uh, filtering that dirt back to the ground um, instead of putting it into your cart or putting it through the fan. Um, but the other, the other benefit is just longevity. Um, you know, twin rod, system, twin rod chains, the system lasts about double the life of the standard wire chain the woven chain um so there's benefits to that as well as you know while we all know it's it is more expensive that is the benefit it, it will last you longer um but you know we again with the dust reduction side uh we we have the technology um here at exact that you know using some water and brushes we can reduce the dust by up to 75 percent um and that's that's a that's a pretty big deal while putting clean product into the cart. So, some a few things to keep in mind there. Um, but it is it is all about efficiency gains and clean product in the cart. Um, 
and how how do we do that right now? Um, those are a, a few tips on on how that can happen. So, again, moving on to low dust, some some of the harvest technology. Um, like I said, they all all manufacturers have taken great strides in this. Um, as we know, a lot of eyes, public eyes, are watching us. Um, a lot of growers have joined in as well. So certainly appreciate everyone kind of collectively coming together here um, for the betterment of our industry, honestly, um, because it, it takes all of us. Um, it really, really does take all of us working together to to do this. As I said, with you know, we're we're producing the bulk of the world's almonds here, and that's not going away. Uh, thankfully, that's not going away. So we we've got to continue to put our best foot forward um, as you know our bullseye on our backs get a little bit bigger. Um, so just put together a quick video of of how this stuff works. Um, let me. Jason, while we're looking at this, uh, any differences you want to pull out between the PTO pull behind and the self-driven uh, pickup machines? Yeah, absolutely, Jesse. Um, you know, as as far as a difference, uh, besides the obvious, um, I, I would venture to say I know I can only speak from from my side uh here at exact i know with with our harvester between the pto and the uh, self-propelled machine we've got about 30 percent more cleaning capacity inside prior to it hitting the fan and i and i would venture to say that's probably you know self-propelled you are going to see a little better cleaning um but it's you know there, there's a trade-off of of the cost um is it, it is significantly more for the self-propelled self-propelled versus um the, the pto harvester but as far as on the dust reduction side um it's really is probably yeah it's it's pretty close nothing too crazy significant you would have you know as far as um control over the cleaning fan speed the self propelled offer that flexibility versus on the pto rigs you do not that's that's pto driven so it's based on on the uh the tractor um the rpms of the tractor driving that fan um so you you're only relying on the wind board of the harvester uh, increasing decreasing suction there um instead of slowing that fan down but again the the trade off for adjusting fan speed is frankly the material in the cart. Um, you, you will you will sacrifice cleaning going into the cart 
uh, while yes, you may hit dust reduction, um, you you will you'll pay the price on the quality and the and the foreign material you put back into the cart, which in turn goes to the to the plant. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Jason, thank you. That was a great presentation, and I I want to. Next, we've got uh, Lucas Avila is with Farmland Management Services, and as uh, Jason described, he's going to uh, give us a sense of how he uses a conditioner and what advantages it, it provides. So, Lucas, over to you. Good morning, everyone. Hope everyone's having a good Tuesday after the Memorial Weekend and uh, getting back at the, the flow of things here. So, yeah, I'll just you know, we, we started, you know, I mean, conditioners aren't a new idea, right? Everybody back in the, you know, 80s and 90s when when we had rain, you know, and you had the later varieties, you know, the Monterey's and the Fritz and everything up, you know, the further north you get, the, the more rain you get. I know we used to do it. Um, we would take our old, you know, conventional harvesters and we would throw a chute on it just to, to help dry them out after a rain event. Um, you know, it wasn't anything to do with low dust. It was more an ef efficiency thing and, and trying to get uh, get the nuts dried out so that we can pick them up and get them to the holer before the next rain event. Um, you know, there's been exact and, uh, you know, a few other companies, Flory, I think, come out with uh, uh, an, a specific machine for conditioning the nuts. Um, so we started dabbling in that probably seven, seven, eight years ago. Um, and it was really, really helpful um, just in wet years and with later varieties, um, being able to go through the field and we, we got the twin rod chains, you know, the dirt chains or, or the walnut chains, some guys will call them, um, to help right there at the head, it drops a ton of the, the dirt and uh, material, you know, and it just sends a cleaner product to the holer. Um, especially with young orchards, you know, when you're still working the ground a little bit, when that first that first harvest comes comes and goes, um, you've got a lot more foreign material. You're sending more more dirt clods and and you know stakes and whatever else you know is in your field the first harvest. So that condition really helps uh, reduce that material going to the holer, which increases your turnout, increases your profitability. Um, you know jason touched on it earlier a lot of guys aren't slowing down during harvest you know because you've got a limited amount of time before your next variety is coming off or um, before the next rain event or before you lose your labor force so um, you're really trying to increase that efficiency and, and a conditioner helps in that way you know in in uh, the later varieties you get that morning dew or you know you you get you can't get your harvesters going and you want to keep your labor force moving along so what we'll do is we'll put them in a conditioner for the first you know few hours in the morning keep them on their schedule keep them moving and then it helps helps that cleaner crop get there and we can start harvesting earlier in the day <clears throat> um, you know the material doesn't bridge up in the trucks you can get all that that debris out of there so you can maintain your harvest speeds uh, and still reduce your dust uh, you know, the, the other thing is a lot of guys in, with older orchards, we're, we're running stick jacks, um, you know, and picking up that material. A conditioner does that, um, you know, obviously if you have major size limbs, you got to go in there with a chainsaw or with a crew and, and get that stuff picked up. But but for for 90 percent, I would say, of, of what you pick up with a stick jack, a conditioner is going to do that. Um, and, it, and it operates the same way, you know, it stores the material in the back and, and drops the nuts out on the bottom. It really helps um, put that crop on top. You get uniform drying. Uh, you can get your water back on the trees quicker. Uh, you don't have that, you know, depending on what the temperature is doing outside that three to 10 days on the ground, letting that, that crop uh, mature and, and dry out. You can, you can sweep it relatively quickly, get your water back on, reduce your stress on your trees, and then help set that next, next year's crop. You can, um, get that real even uniform drying send the cleaner product to the the harvester or to your processor and uh, they'll appreciate it you'll appreciate it when you get your freight bill and, and realize that you know you're getting you know 27 28 percent turnouts instead of 20 22 um, and your, your harvester or your processors can run a lot smoother um, you know and hit the markets when uh, when they need to so um, 
the other thing it really does is it gives you some flexibility with your harvest timing. Um, if you've got some later varieties, uh, you you know where you you need to get that crop in before rain event or for before the dews come in, you can go in there and, and shake them just a little bit on the green side. They got a little more weight to it. If you got butte padres, you know you don't want them sticking to the tree. Uh, you know you can go in there a little bit greener, shake them, sweep them, and then you can condition them. Um, and they're they're nice uniform drying you know some of those crops can yield really really heavy and if you shake them green you get you know a little bit of mold on the other side <clears throat> the underside of the holes and things like that because they're in that big windrow um, but with the conditioner it really helps you spread them out get that uniform consistency and drying um, and then you can shave off quite a bit of time from your harvest you know depending on what size uh, your operation is um, you know the efficiencies gained by being able to get in there and get that crop off and, and get it um, conditioned and get it dry and get it to the processor and the holder sheller, um, you might say, you know, a week, 10 days, depending on how the size of your operation, if you can get that drying time down from, you know, seven to 10 days down to three. So um, there's, there's a lot of gain there. So um, with the, with your, now everybody's seeing competition um, at, at harvest time for labor. Um, and if you don't have uh, the ability to go in and have those people working and and being productive, you know, you can't just pay them to, to stand around. But right now there's so much competition for, for qualified and, and, you know, decent labor. If you can have them doing something, if you get due or rain events or, or whatever it may be, that conditioner is actually a, a huge benefit to you um, as a grower and it keeps your labor force, you know, working. So you don't have the competition, you don't have the guys that say, well, hey, we're off for two days, it rained or three days or whatever. Um, you know, as soon as you can get back into your field, depending on your soil type, you can have those guys work in the next day or two, uh, you know, and they're not going to run run down the street and, and go do something else. So that's it. A, a big benefit that, that we've seen is is having the bodies there to do the work and then keeping them keeping them busy. Um, the the sustainability and stewardship side of things is is important to our company and when you have um, good neighbors, everybody appreciates everybody works better together. So, you know, reducing dust is is always a good thing. Um, I was a little bit surprised at how ambitious the Alma board was when it first came out and then we really started putting our heads together um, with our team and, you know, reducing the, the passes with a sweeper, you know, you might go a little bit slower with a closing arm or with a, with a dual head sweeper or something like that to reduce that dust. But in the long term, it, it, it reduces passes. And so even though you might feel like you're moving a little bit slower, um, you know, every pass counts and, and if you can reduce those passes it it helps reduce the dust and it's it's good to be in, in the front the forefront of the industry um, to maintain that that uh, stewardship of the environment and the people that that we have out there so it's a good it's a good goal it's a challenging goal which is always is always a good thing but keeps you creative and and really looking at your processes and at the end of the day it, if you're doing those things um, you end up saving saving costs and improving the quality of the product going to the processor, which you know increases your bottom line at the end of the day. So um, I know it's not for for everyone. Um, you know, some sometimes in in you know like this year it's dry, and we'll uh, probably won't necessarily need to use it during uh, the non-perel crop or you know some of those independents coming off early. Um, is it for the moisture content. Uh, necessarily but it could help you get your crop cleaner if you've got a dirty field or a young orchard um, it'll definitely improve what you send to the processor and the holer and and they'll they'll appreciate it for you uh, your efforts and and generally they can give you a better better product at the end that, that goes to market so that's that's kind of my uh my two cents on on conditioners it's not a new idea i think farmers for a long time when it was wet were uh, using their harvesters and converting them over just so they can get the crop out of the field um, 
and and now that there's been some um, companies that have really embraced it and, and really perfected and improved the process, I think it's critical um, to to look at these new new pieces of equipment and how it really does affect your 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 product and your harvest and your bottom line. It's not just the cost of the equipment. Um, there's there's multiple benefits across across the use of these these conditioners. You know, just what fits for your operation and what what makes sense. So. Move ahead to Ted Strauss. Uh, Ted, are you are you on the line? I see you are. I am on the line. And there's Good your morning. video. Good morning. <laughs> Hi. So Ted Ted's uh, worked with the almond board for quite a while, a real champion of our uh, low dust harvester program, uh, worked with us on our on the first time that we tested dust coming out of our, our pickup machines and helped get uh, equipment qualified. And I, I know that because you uh, certify equipment based on PM10, correct, Ted? Uh, yeah, most of our standards are based on PM10 because they were written when PM10 was a, well, it's PM10 is still a big issue. You know, even though we're in attainment for PM10, the trick is maintaining attainment. You know, we want to still make sure that we don't cause any exceedances. So, but uh, PM2.5, of course, is becoming more preva prevalent. And so, um, you know, it is kind of the, the pollutant of concern these days. And like you said, Jesse, you know, um, almond uh, harvesting activities really happen outside of the PM 2.5 window, but it's still just as important to reduce visible dust in PM 10 and PM 2.5 where we can. So, well, 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 great. Thanks. Uh, thanks for joining us today and uh, telling, explaining to growers how they can work within RCS to help reduce the cost of using equipment i know uh your program and uh i know you got slides that you could pull up here in a second um uh your program focuses on per acre of of use correct whereas the the incentive program by the san joaquin valley air air district is uh a cost share per piece of equipment and uh with that i'm going to hand it over to you and uh take it away ted thanks a lot okay can you see my slides? Perfect. Oh, cool. Okay. Um, well, thank you. I, I, I do work for the USDA NRCS in California. Um, I am the air quality specialist for the state. And so um, I work with farmers and uh, mostly with our planners, really, um, throughout the states dealing with air quality. Um, I took this uh, copy of the uh, MODIS satellite image this morning. And you can see there's not much snow left in the Sierra, so um, I'm sure all of you are monitoring the water situation. Um, but, you know, lack of water has an influence on air quality, too. Um, so, I, you know, there's no question we're going to have a very dry season, and that could have an impact on um, dust operations um, on your farms. Um, this was released last year and and even though some of the dates are from last year it's still really relevant uh, for what we're doing right now this was put together with the assistance of the almond board and um with idea that um nrcs is here uh, to help promote conservation planning in fact conservation planning is really the major goal of of our of our agency um we do this through technical assistance. It's totally totally voluntary. We don't charge for it. It's at the client's invitation and discretion, and it is confidential. Um, what conservation planning does, it helps identify what the resource concerns are. And we have this acronym that we call SWAPA plus HE. Uh, SWAPA stands for soil, water, air, plants, animals, and the HE stands for the human element, and the E is for energy. Um, but through conservation planning, uh, there might be financial assistance opportunities to help implement uh, those practices to improve the resource concerns. In regards to air quality, um, we look at five different resource concerns. Um, of course, with 
um, almond harvest activities, most of it is going to be particulate. Um, but we also look at ozone precursors, which is mostly from combustion sources um, and objectionable odors. Um, greenhouse gases is going to be more and more and more of an issue these days. And uh, finally, airborne reactive nitrogen, which deals primarily with, uh, with nitrogen fertilization and also with combustion sources. Our financial assistance uh, for many growers is through two mechanisms. One is the Environmental Quality Incentive Program, where we look at what resource concerns there are and, um, and we have payments available to help address those, the technical assistance that goes with our plans. Um, and then we also have what's called Conservation Stewardship Program, which helps producers maintain and improve uh, their existing conservation systems. Um, and so it, it sort of rewards growers for doing the right thing. Going over the quick payment rates, um, I tried to really look at what would benefit uh, the almond industry. And um, the, our, our most popular program, of course, is replacing in-use mobile diesel powered equipment. Um, this is what we call our tractor replacement program. Um, going from like a really old high polluting tier zero tractor to uh, a tractor that's uh, has the latest emission standards on them. It helps reduce uh, particulate matter from the tailpipe emissions and um, as well as NOx, which is a precursor to form uh, PM 2.5. Um, and so it, it is one of our most popular programs. Uh, we also help repower irrigation pump engines, uh, whether it's going to a new electric or new diesel engine. Um, we offer payments for that. And there again, our resource concerns are focused on ozone and particulate. Oops. Um, we also offer payments to treat unpaved roads. Uh, we offer uh, three different solutions uh, for, for treating unpaved roads. Um, lignin derivatives are not really too popular right now, but they uh, have gained a little bit uh, uh, more attention these days. Um, lignin, if you don't know, is a byproduct of the pulp industry. It is a, a, a product of uh, basically uh, from wood, and um, but it, it is kind of a, a short term solution. Uh, applying this right before harvest. Um, is often a very good solution for controlling dust uh, during those high uh, traffic events that you might have on unpaved roads. Um, the polymer emulsions, uh, ironically, a lot of the uh, wineries are using this nowadays, um, and um, uh, we do offer payments for that. And, but in the Valley, most uh, growers uh, still go with the road oils. Uh, we offer payments either for the what's a, called a slow cure 250, or the SC800, and um, those are still very popular. I'm starting to see more uh, farmers uh, actually putting a layer of recycled asphalt chips down before putting the road oils on it, uh, which uh, provides a more durable um, surface. And there again, our resource concern is particulate. Um, a lot of the conversation, the focus really is on low dust harvesters these days. And as Jesse did mention, um, uh, we pay by the acre of the use of the equipment. We we don't offer payments to replace the equipment. Um, Jason did an excellent job on how they work and a lot of the benefits with that. Um, but uh, really where this is going to benefit uh, most producers uh, are those that rely on jobbers. Um, we under equip, we can go uh, up to a three year contract. In other words, uh, you can apply for um, to receive payments uh, for over a three year period to utilize low dust harvesters. Um, if uh, if you already own the equipment, then you, then the resource concern has already been met. And unfortunately, the way uh, equip is written, um, you wouldn't qualify for an equipped program because you're already meeting the resource concern. But if you don't have the equipment now, then you're a really good candidate uh, for a program. Doesn't mean that during that three year 
contract, you couldn't purchase uh, a low dust harvester. I'm just saying that if you do want to take advantage of our program, then you really want to apply those acres where um, you are not use, utilizing low dust harvesters right now. Um, the the uh, list is there. Um, these were all based on the studies that were done in 2010 and 2017 by Texas A&M. And um, maybe someday we'll add more equipment to this. Um, I, I certainly hope we can. And I keep going backwards. OK, um, we also pay offer payments for chipping orchard removals. Now I know that's not harvesting. Usually the orchard removals happen after the last harvest. Um, but but the 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 benefit, the resource concern benefit is that it avoids uh, agricultural burning. And these days with a lot of the burn restrictions, but especially in the San Joaquin Valley that are taking place, there might be opportunities where we could offer a payment to help uh, chip those orchards. And um, this year we offered uh, whole orchard recycling. Many of you probably have heard of this. Um, I know the district, uh, Air District has uh, offered payments for this also. Um, you know, our payment is $242.09 per acre. If you add that to the, with the chipping contract, it comes out to just a little over $1,000 an acre. Um, and the resource concerns, of course, are, are quite high. Um, sort of pre-harvest uh, activities is, of course, spraying your orchard. And uh, a lot of the, um, we've we've uh, promoted these sensor uh, technologies for many years now, and they work really best on the younger orchards where uh, the machine shuts on, turns on and shuts off uh, when it ever sees a, um, a plant. And um, the, the, the pesticide savings also translates to lower VOC emissions. Uh, which is an ozone precursor, and it also uh, reduces uh, uh, drift, pesticide drift, which is a, a particulate um, a pre, uh, resource concern uh, for our programs. So the application deadlines, we have one more deadline coming up that's June 9th for EQUIP. Uh, conservation stewardship programs already passed, but it doesn't mean that you couldn't still uh, submit an application to one of our service centers uh, if if this interests you. Um, I do encourage you that if you are uh, interested in conservation planning and also seeking financial assistance, um, that you do uh, contact your respective service center uh, within your county. And that's the link there. So that is the end of my presentation. If you have any questions, I am available. Ted, thank you for that presentation. All right. Uh, Ted, thanks as always. Great information. And I would also add, uh, since he did mention the IPM 595 practice, we do have a new guide out from NRCS that walks growers through uh, what they would need to do for naval orange worm management to uh, help satisfy those requirements to get to get that cost share. And that also includes help with uh, paying for mating disruption. So another reason to go into your local NRCS office and uh, and uh, start the conservation planning process. Um, is there is there a question? I did just see something come in. If you want to come off mute, or you can type it in the chat. I'll come off and give it a little bit more of a personal deal. I was I was asking for specifics on the tractor trade in program. If you have multiple fleet tractors that are old or out of compliance, can you trade them in? Um, if you had, say, two older tractors and then could you trade both of them in to work towards one newer tractor if your your operation is downgraded or you need less equipment? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the 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 issue always comes as to whether or not the new tractor will replace the service of the two that it's replacing. So if you're going to turn in two for one, 
um, that's an evaluation we would have to make with you um, if if because the whole idea with the uh, the the uh, with the practice is to um, to not only just improve air quality but to ensure that the tractor doesn't operate more um, and create more pollution than the equipment that it's replacing. So um, yeah, the concept is there. You know, we've done a few. Uh, we've done a lot of those in, in the very early programs, um, but uh, most popular is one for one. Um, and and there again, that that option is there if if that's that's something that you want to look into. Thank you. Yeah, we generally won't go more than two for one. Um, but there again, we have to evaluate whether or not that one tractor is replacing the service of the two that is replacing. And that's based on hours of use. If you had two tractors that you were splitting time on because one's a 120 and one's an 80 and you got a one a 110 horsepower and it was going to do the work of both, then there would be an hour evaluation. Yeah, basically you're correct. If if one is a 100 hour a tractor and the other one's a 200 hour tractor, then we would expect the new one to operate 300 hours. Or thereabouts anyway. Thanks. Any more questions for Ted? OK, well, again, thank you, Ted. And uh, next up, uh, we've got Ashley Korea. Ashley, looks like you're you're on the line, and uh, you're going to walk us through the the 2025 metrics and how we keep track of low dust practices in CASP. All right. Thanks. Good morning, everybody. All right, Jesse. Next slide. OK, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the CASP program. The CASP program is an online platform, which there are nine modules in the ass assessment. And to complete the assessment, we would like you to complete all nine modules. But here's a little bit of a timeline um, about the assessment when the modules started getting added. Back in 2009, two were added. And then in 2011, three more were added to get you a total of five. And then 2015, three more were added to get you a total of eight. And then finally, the last one in 2016 was bee health and pollination. So currently, these are the nine assessment or nine modules to complete the one assessment. OK, so focusing in on our air quality module, which is going to go into the harvest dust conversation in this module there's 88 questions and it kind of gives you a breakdown on this slide you have orchard floor management which is seven questions they talk about unpaved surfaces and reducing particles which is three questions and the big bulk of the questions are 26 on harvest reducing reducing particles and then you go into reducing particulates in a lot of different areas, greenhouse gases, irrigation efficiencies, and pest management, to fertilization to orchard removal. So these are all questions that have some type of concept around air quality and controlling what we're doing in the field and what everyone's doing on their operations to make sure that they're reducing harvest dust. All right, so there, here are some other resources that the Almond Board has for their growers, and these resources can be found on our website under Grower Tools um, Harvest Dust. So these are examples of the harvest dust management tools, and it gives you sweeper information, talks about the number of passes, manufacturer recommended sweeper head height, wire tines designed to reduce passes and reduce dust. And then also looking into the harvest pickup, which is talking about using a conditioner, which we heard about today, um, lowered ground speed and separator fans, and then low dust or off ground harvesting, which is definitely a concept that we are discussing. And then, of course, orchard floor management, making sure you're keeping your middles clean and compact to make sure when harvest comes around, there's less dust going in the air. 
OK, so kind of going back into the cast assessment questions, here are some examples of the questions in the air quality module. So here's questions 11 through 14, and it talks about, you know, year round floor management resulted in a smooth and level clean orchard floor at harvest to help optimize harvest efficiency and minimize dust. So when you're completing this module, you're going to go through and look at these questions and answer them the best you can. So in your operation, if you do floor management, you're going to click yes. And then going down to like question number 14, it talks to you about how many sweeper passes and blower passes were used. You know, zero because a sweeper was not used or three or more. And in most cases, depending on the equipment being used, you'll see two, sometimes you'll see three or more, and then th that would be having some conversation. Um, normally when a grower tells us that there's something that's three or more. So when we're doing those type of things, we always make sure that we talk, interact with the grower when we're doing our field visits and we talk about the questions. But here you can see this is in the, the dust and PM10 control strategies at harvest section. And then going on to more, here's some additional questions in the module. And this is going to be talking about was at least one type of low dust harvester used. So this is asking if you are using a low dust harvester on your operation. In this case, if you are using a low dust harvester, you would you click select yes and then go and answer 31, 32, 33. If you're in this case, it has skip logic. So if you're not using a low dust harvester on your operation, that's totally fine. You would just click no. And then once you click no, it'll skip you all the way down to question number 33. So you can continue answering the questions in the air quality module. But most of these are just asking, you know, if you are using a low dust harvester, what type of low dust harvester are you using? Um, what technology are you using? And um, is it completely an off ground or is it a combination between the two? OK, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the Almond Orchard 2025 goals. Here are the goals that the Almond Board set forth so that we can achieve by uh, 2025. And here are the four goals. It's furthering reducing the water used to grow almonds, achieving zero waste in our orchards, increasing adoption of environmentally friendly pest management tools, and improving local air quality dust almond harvest. So these are the Orchard 2025 goals, and each of these sections or each of these goals are answered or kept count or track of in the California Almond Sustainability Platform. This platform allows growers to be able to answer these questions and allow us to talk through and get out information when it comes to an area where we may feel under attack or there's pressure that the industry may be doing something but in reality we have the facts to prove and support what's happening so here as you can see the cast program is definitely measuring these goals and keeping in line of what is going on in the industry so deep diving more into the almond orchard 2025 goals and air quality Ultimately, we want to improve the air quality during almond harvest. I don't know. I mean, growing up in the valley, you see the plumes of dust. Yes, we understand that is not detrimental to our health, but to the community, a lot of them not do not know that, and they're like, oh, all I see is dust. So we're trying to, as an industry, to move in the right direction in, in terms of educating the community as well as making sure we are doing our part by reducing sweeper passes trying to get more low, low dust harvesters on operations and then looking into off-ground harvesting which we are understanding that's coming sooner and sooner around the corner and then also looking at self-compatible varieties like the independence you know hopefully only one shake but you may have to do two shakes with some stick tights but then also you know looking into what we can do with our water and everything like that to make sure our air quality is better during the harvest. All right, I think I'm gonna pass this over back over to Jesse and then Jesse can, you know, touch on any points that he would like if I missed any and then give it over to Miranda. No, that was great, Ashley. I think you covered everything that we were hoping to get through. So I, I think uh, 
at this point, um, I think we'll give it one more opportunity for questions of any of the speakers. And uh, while you're thinking of those, or if you have any, just uh, you can go ahead and come off mute or type them in the chat. But otherwise, I'm going to I'm going to close out my section and just thank Miranda, Jason, Lucas, Ted and Ashley for uh, putting this together and speaking today and uh, have a great summer and uh, have a great harvest. <laughs>